Our next speaker this afternoon is Douglas French. He's the president of the Mises Institute, and his lecture this afternoon is on money and banking. Doug? Thank you. Thank you. Is this on? OK. Well, I've been selected to do this lecture uh, because of my many years in the banking industry, uh, which uh, provides me absolutely no background to give me the speech. But however, uh, I'm the one that's been selected. I wanted to uh, mention something that was in a, a profile of, of Jim Grant that was, uh, if you don't know Jim Grant, Grant's Interest Rate Observer is uh, a wonderful publication to read. It's horribly expensive, but uh, very, uh, very valuable. But Jim Grant was interviewed by the Wall Street Journal recently, and he said, he made a comment about dollars piling up in Asia, merchandise piles up here. And um, the point was that America, because it has the printing press, has tried to achieve the ancient hope of mankind to live without working. Now, Joe Salerno mentioned this in his talk this morning, that if money grew on trees, nobody would work, right? And the same applies that if everybody had a printing press, would you work? No, not at all. It wouldn't work at all. You'd just print money and exchange it for goods and services. And that reminded me, that quote in, in the Wall Street Journal uh, from Grant, reminded me of a book called Farmer Boy, written by Laura Ingalls Wilder. And she wrote this book about uh, a boy named Almanzo who, uh, I won't go into the whole story, but uh, Almanzo wanted a little money to buy some lemonade when he was in town, and his father decided to give him a half dollar. And uh, so it was a half dollar, something like, like that. Not an upside down one, maybe like that. And we'll try to Telescope that so you can see it a little better. And yeah, there we go. That's a 1957 half dollar. That coin is as old as I am. I dare say it's in better shape. And certainly uh, has held up a little better than I have. But uh, anyway, that's, uh, that's 57 coins, similar to the story that um, Laura Ingalls Wilder was telling. And so uh, after giving his son the half dollar, uh, his father asked him, do you know what the half dollar is? Well, Monzo had never seen anything beyond a penny or a nickel, so he didn't really understand what he meant. And ultimately he said, that it's work, son. That's what money is, it's hard work. And it really, in my mind, displays the difference between other economic schools of thought, and the Austrians. Because I think for the Austrians, uh, the money is work. It's hard work. But for other disciplines that are very undisciplined in economics, um, money is just something you can print out of nowhere. If there's no savings, you can just print savings. So on and so forth. So, um, and that's, that's the way I want to start this today. But you know, money doesn't, and it, it did not, and it could not originate by the order of the state. It must originate with the processes of the free market. And before there was money, there was barter. Goods were produced by those who were good at it, and if there was any surplus in those goods uh, that they produced, they used the excess goods, uh, not just for their own use, but to trade with others as barter. And of course, we all know a number of things have been used as barter, you know, shells and tobacco and cigarettes and uh, uh, prisoner of war camps and things like that. Ox has somehow been used as money. We've heard about all these things. We don't need to go through that. But that's how barter started. These were generally recognized goods that everybody recognized the value of, and people traded those goods to um, get the things that they want. 
Now their problem with barter uh, presents itself very quickly, and that's the double coincidence of wants. For you to trade with someone, they have to want what you have, and you have to want what they have. And that's a, that's a problem, right? I mean, I think a lot of trades could be made in this room, but it doesn't always mean that you have what someone wants and vice versa. So that's the initial large, large problem that you have with, uh, with barter. The second problem is indivisibility. You may have a good somebody wants, but you don't have the quantity they want, or you can't, you can't um, make it less or make it more, you can't divide it up. It's kind of like going to Costco. You know, if you go to Costco, if, if any of you have been there, um, you, can't, um, you can't buy a tube of toothpaste. You have to buy a case of toothpaste or something like that. So th you've got this problem in barter with indivisibility. Another problem is business calculation. Business firms must be able to determine whether they're earning a profit or a loss, and that is impossible, impossible under the barter system. So since uh, not many people want to trade for what an individual person has the excess of, he or she must buy other goods to trade with. So a lot of times you will trade with things that you don't necessarily need, but you know that they'll be worth something as far as a medium of exchange. People trade labor and goods for a medium of exchange. And that's what any of you that have a job do this all the time. If you have a job, you're trading for a medium of exchange. You're trading uh, for money so that you can buy what you want. Medium of change is that um, instrument of indirect exchange. Now, as, as people see that a certain commodity is used as a, a medium of exchange, has a high marketability, uh, its use becomes money. And money is a huge leap forward in the history of civilization. It prevents, uh, it permitted man to overcome the obstacles of barter. It permitted uh, man to overcome this double of coincidence of wants, the indivisibility problem, and most importantly, this uh, biz, uh, problem of business calculation. We can now calculate whether a business is uh, profitable or a loss. Um, because we have this medium of exchange. So what determines money's purchasing power? How is that determined? Well, Mises um, did some work that extended on Menger's work. And of course, Joe talked a lot about Menger this morning. And uh, what Mises, his extension of Menger's work, uh, he developed the monetary regression theorem. Monetary regression theorem. And according to that, is that um, the purchasing power of money today is based on what that money could be traded for yesterday, or its purchasing power yesterday. And at the same time, the purchasing power of the money yesterday was determined by the demand for money, which developed based on the knowledge of the purchasing power from the day before. And we can trace this pattern all the way back to the moment when the first time in history people began to demand a certain good as a medium of exchange. Therefore, this theorem reflects Menger's theory on the spontaneous emergence and evolution of money. Now, the cumulative development of a medium of exchange on the free market is that the only, that's the only way money can be established. Now, I know you've probably had textbooks already that have told you under the definition of money, it's whatever the state says it is, right? I'm, I know I had that when I went to school. But money cannot originate in any other way. It must be created in the market through this regression theorem that Mises outlays, or lays out. So 
whether it's you or whether it's the government cannot suddenly get in the business of just printing up tickets that they call money. And it can't happen that way. It morphs into that, but we'll get to that in a minute. So what will be picked as money? A commodity that, anybody want to take any guesses? I know I'm not supposed to ask any questions, but what would be the first thing you would want uh, for the perfect money? Marketability, yes. Gen generally marketable. How about what's next? What? Fungible. Yeah, okay. Homogeneous, maybe, is another way to say that. What else? Divisible, thank you. Durable, yes. 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 Yes, same thing. You're missing one. No. <laughs> All right. <laughs> High value per unit weight. You want to be able to carry it around and still have some value with you. Um, there was a little piece in, uh, written by a guy in Smart Money over the weekend that I blogged about. Um, and of course, it's uh, surprising how dumb people are who write for publications called things like Smart Money. But uh, he seemed to imply that uh, oil would be a better uh, money than, well, he didn't actually put it that way, but I put some words in his mouth. Uh, he, he thought that... <laughs> He thought that oil was a better, uh, uh, better than gold, and uh, I would hasten to point out that carrying oil around is not terribly practical. Now, now over time, two commodities have become dominant uh, in the area of money, and one is uh, uh, silver and the other is gold. So this is, uh, that's a uh, Morgan silver dollar. Let's see if we can zoom that up just a little bit. And that's 1921. And then this, uh, this thing here. Uh, and that's an ounce of gold from 1856. So these have traditionally been um, money right here. And uh, they were both highly prized for their luster, uh, their ornamental value. Who in the room would not want, say, this? Anybody? Anybody? Not want it? Uh, no, right. In fact, you'd probably take any of that just because they look great, right? Possibly you might want to trade them for the goods and services you could get down on uh, uh, at Magnolian College, but I don't know how that might work, but uh, it's possible. <laughs> so, but gold and silver are very dis divisible and they're very durable. Every uh, ounce of gold that's ever been mined is still in existence, and, uh, and it can easily be formed into coins. Now, has anybody um, ever had uh, a textbook, learned economics uh, from a textbook written by Paul Samuelson? Yeah, two, three, four, five. Yeah, a few of you. And uh, in his 11th edition, of something, and, and Samuelson made a lot of money writing textbooks. But he said that, uh, you know, he starts out kind of good that wampum used to have uh, decorative uses, and, and then paper money became as, uh, began as warehouse receipts and uh, mint receipts and uh, for so much metal and so on. He's, he's pretty good so far. Um, but then he said, money isn't wanted for money, but just it's only wanted to, uh, for use to get rid of. He said, money is accepted because it's accepted. That was his uh, big payoff line there. Uh, I'll repeat that in case you didn't understand it. Money is accepted because it is accepted, uh, which is terribly unsatisfying for an explanation, but that's, it worked for Samuelson. Uh, but anyway, my favorite, uh, the favorite thing that he wrote here is he, he said, by the printing of more and more or fewer zeros on the face of a bill, a great or small amount of value can be embodied in a light, transportable medium of little bulk. Okay, So he's implying that you can uh, just uh, print numbers on a bill and uh, create 
the value that you want. So this is, of course, one of my, my uh, favorite bills. We'll get, uh, we'll get this real money out of the way for the big show, uh, which is this from the Bank of Iraq back when they were, uh, and uh, that handsome guy when he still had a head on his shoulders. Um, <laughs> Uh, anyway, 10,000 10, 10, dinars, um, there you go. So anyway, they created value. According to Samuelson, they created value uh, with this bill. Um, and in fact, um, he makes a statement, by careful engraving, by careful engraving, the value of money can be protected from counterfeiting and adulteration. The fact that private individuals cannot create it at will in unlimited amounts keeps it scarce, i.e. an economic and not free good. So if we just trust in the government, then the government will uh, make sure that printed money will become a scarce uh, economic good. And, you know, when 50 trillion just won't do it, uh, then a few months later, we end up, we end up with that. So, uh, but that's the view of uh, Samuelson, and a few of us learned from Samuelson, and, and that's why uh, some of us have to come to Auburn to relearn some of these things. But uh, anyway, I wanted to, uh, you know, when... Samuelson said money was scarce. Uh, by the way, Samuelson was born in 1915, and, uh, and he died at the end of 2009. When Samuelson was born, the M2 money supply in the United States was $17.6 billion, 17.6. Uh, when his first textbook was published in 1948, the M2 had grown to $148 billion. And by the time he had died at the end of 09, he, um, the uh, M2 had grown to $8.5 trillion. So uh, while uh, the great textbook writer Samuelson said the government was going to keep control of, uh, of uh, the money supply and keep it scarce, and an economic good, it hasn't uh, exactly worked out that way. Now, speaking of the supply of money, what, what should it be? What should the supply of money be? We get that all the time, um, but as uh, Murray Rothbard always wondered, you know, economists could never uh, ask the question, why, why should the supply of biscuits or shoes or titanium or anything else, what, what should the supply of that be? Uh, and any other good, we leave it to the market to decide, right? Um, but when people talk about the money, uh, money supply, they have this preconceived notion of what it should, should be. It should be more, it should be less. Uh, but money, of course, is different than biscuits, uh, for obvious reasons. But um, the more biscuits the have, uh, we have, uh, the better off we are. And um, the, uh, the more plants and equipment we have, the better off we are, and the more plants that produce biscuits, uh, we, we have the better off we are. This is not the case with money. Murray made the case. Uh, money's different because money isn't used up in consumption or production, despite the fact that it is indispensable for production and exchange of money. Money is simply transferred from one person's assets to another. So having more money doesn't make us any better off. Mises wrote that uh, any supply of money is uh, equally optimal to any other, doesn't matter what the supply of money is. And in fact, if overnight everyone's uh, cash balances were doubled, society wouldn't be any better off. Because real resources, labor, capital, goods, natural resources, productivity, none of that had changed. Prices overall would double, no one would be better off, with the exception of those. Well, who would be better off? What? People in, debt. People in debt, yeah, okay, but hmm, I'm going for something else. Thank you, the first receivers, because the first receivers who get the money, the people who grab it out of the sky first, presumably the taller people, 
Um, <laughs> Yao Ming or whoever that guy is that just retired. Um, could grab the, the money first, run over to McDonald's, bid, bid up the, the price of uh, Jeff Tucker's favorite food, Big Macs. <laughs> And, uh, and of course, Jeffrey would be uh, worse off as the rest of us would be. So the market's, uh, but the market's perfectly capable of deciding what the money should, uh, supply should be. No need for it to keep up with the population growth or any of that. That's something we always hear about gold, by the way, is that there's not enough gold. Can't have any gold, gold can't be money. There's just not enough of it. Um, and uh, it's just not true. Uh, I remember Murray saying in class, you could have a gold standard based on one ounce if you wanted to. Um, so there's just uh, no such thing as a proper supply of money. Now, for gold to be money, how would gold be money? The only way that gold would be money uh, and the only way it would be mined for money is that um, the cost of mining would be less than the value that it would have as money. Right? If, if it cost more to mine the gold than it was worth in trading for other goods and services, um, the money wouldn't be produced. The mines would not produce that money. Now, there's another way to create money, and that's called counterfeiting. Instead of, it, uh, instead of going to the trouble and expense of mining gold or mining silver, mining diamonds or whatever, platinum, whatever the you might uh, choose as money, um, you can counterfeit. And counterfeiting is fraud. If brass is pawned off as gold, uh, the seller who accepts the brass is being cheated along with everybody else. And counterfeit coins continue to circulate in the money supply, uh, overall prices will, will rise. The new counterfeit money deletes the existing uh, value of the existing dollars. Counterfeiting is an inflation process that in, uh, injures anyone and all legitimate money holders by having their purchasing power diluted. So counterfeit, uh, again, defrauds and injures everyone. But not everybody is harmed. If you counterfeit, who benefits? Hello? The counterfeiters benefit first. Those who receive the counterfeit money first benefit. Now, the government's supposed to apprehend counterfeiters, and they do. Um, if you want to go to jail, um, get in the counterfeiting business, because they do not like competition. So uh, I don't care how good your copier is, they'll find you. So uh, the counterfeiter is now the government. And it was the invention of paper money that allowed government to really, really, really get into the counterfeiting business. Now, um, just to, when we talk about these first groups that get the money, uh, there are essentially two people who, or two groups that are benefiting right now uh, from getting the money first. Who is that? Two of them. They both start with W. Wall Street, thank you, that's one. What's the other one? Washington, yes, very good, very good. In fact, Jim Grant wrote, the fiat dollar is an elite system, he says, and Wall Street is supporting, uh, is its supporting interest group. Those nimble, market savvy, plugged in folks who know how to shuffle assets and exploit cheap funding from the Fed to leverage up their profits and soften the downside. So when we talk about, we generally talk about in, in talks like this, um, who gets the money first? Yeah, government, of course, and then government contractors, maybe Halliburton and some, you know, whatever other companies Dick Cheney owns. But, um, but we've got to talk about Wall Street right now because Wall Street is getting the benefit of this free dough that's just gushing out of the, the Fed that uh, we'll see a little bit later. So... So, uh, and who loses? You know who loses. Hello? Oh, well, not, okay. I was thinking more pensioners. You, none of you guys are on a pension yet. Uh, or uh, who live away, far away from uh, government projects. Um, I suppose low-skilled workers. Hopefully you don't put yourself in that low-skilled class. 
But um, any, anyone who is, uh, is kind of on the lower end of the totem pole is going to uh, be harmed. Now, kings uh, have been doing this forever. Uh, this didn't start with paper money. It started uh, uh, centuries ago. Kings would take the gold. They would call it in. They would shave off. Uh, they would call it sweating or crying or clipping the coins. They'd end up with a pile of coins and they'd recoin it. So they'd make the coins smaller, keep them in the same denomination, and make uh, more coins from the shavings. And this is how that was done. Now, that was uh, very slow, as you can imagine, and not terribly efficient. So when they got in the paper money business, that's when this thing really took off. And uh, so the first thing they did was they started uh, creating um, uh, tickets, essentially, uh, or notes that um, would uh, be redeemable in gold. This is a United States uh, silver certificate. You can see at the top it says silver certificate, and at the bottom it says $1 in silver payable to the bearer on demand. Uh, some of you may have these stored away. Maybe grandma had them, maybe your folks. Um, I challenge you to grab a handful of those, head to the treasury, and see if they will give you silver. <laughs> it will be a wasted trip. They will trade the, those dollars for brand new crisp um, paper ones. Uh, there is no silver to be backed uh, by this dollar. Um, they used to have gold certificates, same way. The reading was the same. You, this, uh, this bill was uh, redeemable in gold. Um, so uh, Larry Parks, uh, supporter of the Institute, lives in New York, uh, actually made the analogy that this is like having a coat check. You guys have been to the, uh, to the opera or an expensive restaurant, and you've put your coat away, and you get a little coat check, right? a little coat check to give back to them to get your coat back at the end of the performance or at the end of dinner. This is like a coat check right here. This was supposed to, wasn't really the real money. The real money was the silver that was being held and that eventually you could turn this in and get your coat back, so to speak, or your money back. Um, but uh, what do you suppose? Uh, there's no silver, there's no gold. So now all we have is coat checks, but no coats, is uh, the best way to put it. And as Murray Rothbard said, that is when government is in seventh heaven, when there is no money backing uh, the dollar, then uh, they can print it as much as they want. And of course, the last uh, just slight semblance to uh, any sort of monetary standard uh, was undone by uh, Richard Nixon in uh, 1971. I believe it was a hot August day uh, when he when he did that. So, um, and at this point, we kind of enter into this Keynesian world where um, uh, we're all sophisticated. Uh, nobody's old-fashioned wanting you know, to trade in gold. It's a barbarous relic, as uh, John Maynard Keynes used to say. That whole gold-silver thing is very uh, old-fashioned. Sophisticated people uh, are the ones who use paper, paper money. And in fact, the smart money guy said that people who believe in gold uh, are, uh, are wearing tinfoil pants, whatever that means. I had heard of tinfoil hat wearers. I had not heard of... Um, tinfoil uh, pants wearers, but uh, the current, uh, current gold bugs would be put in that category. So, so the demand for money, um, money being a good like any, uh, anything else, there's a demand for it, there's a supply of it, and uh, if goods and services supply in the economy, the demand for money in exchange will also increase. So again, if you have more goods and services, there'll be more demand for money. And historically, uh, goods and services uh, have usually increased every year. And this increase in demand for money will tend to lower prices over time. Uh, prices fell from the mid-18th century uh, up until 1940, with the exception of a few war periods. 
And uh, generally during the war, they don't like taxing people directly uh, to pay for wars, so they'd rather just print money to pay the troops and the uh, arms dealers, and so you have, a, you have inflation. Now, the demand for money is affected by the frequency in which people get paid. Uh, the more often you get paid, the less uh, money you're going to carry. Uh, but also, um, there's technological uh, changes that uh, serve to lower the demand for cash. And um, like uh, credit cards and um, credit cards, if, you, if you're running around with a credit card, you don't need as much cash on you. Uh, if you get paid all the time, you don't need that. Um, and in fact, the other technological change, and I don't know if you saw this in the New York Times, is that um, their money, um, paper money, is starting to last longer. And they're actually quite proud of it. A dollar bill will now last 40 months instead of 18. It used to be every 18 months they'd get worn out. And they'd have to destroy them and print new ones. Now they last 40 months. Now, if you compare that to um, to this thing, that's 1921. That dollar's lasted a long, lot longer than you know, 40 months, for crying out loud. But the, the government these days believes that their 40 months is uh, a wonderful thing. And that's why they're not printing as much money. In fact, um, they, uh, you can see that on the, in the 50s there, uh, right here, they didn't print a few years. 50s are kind of scarce. They didn't print any 10s here lately or 10s over here lately. Um, and this year, by the way, is the first time they've printed more $100 bills than they've printed singles. If you can see that, but slightly. Any reason why? Any guesses? What? No. No. Yeah, that's, you're close enough for jazz. <laughs> Two thirds of the $100 bills end up overseas. It costs a dime to make a hundred. You're right, it costs a dime to make a single. So why not print hundreds and ship two thirds of them overseas? That's a heck of a business. I'm telling you, if any of you can get in that business, please do it. If you can make something for a dime and get a hundred bucks out of it, man, it doesn't get any better than that. And that's what the treasury is doing. In fact, they paid the Fed $20 billion in synergy, uh, uh, to the treasury. That's the difference between what it takes to create money and, and uh, what you get for it. So uh, the f uh, creating money, creating $100 bills, shipping them overseas, because people overseas think that $100 bills are going to retain their value. They have a lot more confidence in the United States monetary system than I do, for instance, but be that as it may, that's a, a great business that they're currently, uh, they're currently in. There are now more than 7 billion pictures of Benjamin Franklin uh, floating around out there. But how long is the Treasury going to be able to get away with that? Who knows? And that brings me to the um, next question. The public's confidence in money must be strong for the demand for money to stay high. Demand for paper money is very volatile, volatile, while the demand for gold and silver is always high. There's always a high demand for gold and silver. Paper money, it's very volatile. And the demand for paper money is driven by confidence, or the lack thereof, the public and the viability of issuing government. Now, public expectations um, in future levels, is, price levels, is far and away the most important determinant of demand for money. And of course, uh, Keynes, by the way, uh, he, he considered people evil who held on to money uh, for speculative purposes. Uh, he thought that was the worst thing a person could possibly do, and the government had to do anything they could to pry money that was being laying there fallow, not doing anything. So 
the demand for money rises, if it's expected, the prices will fall. And the demand for money will fall if the public expects prices to increase. Now that sounds a little backwards from what you might think initially, but that's, so I'll just say it again. Demand for money rises if it's, if you think prices are gonna fall, you're gonna wanna hold more cash, spend it later when prices fall. Demand for money falls if you think, um, prices are going to increase. You're gonna to wanna to buy at today's prices rather than tomorrow's. Inflationary price expectations mean lower prices. Inflationary prices mean higher, higher prices. Expectations component of the demand for money speculative and reactive rather than a independent source, force. Now, Mises outlined, we get this question all the time too, um, because if you're an Austrian and uh, we haven't had hyperinflation yet and everybody's going, when are we gonna get this hyperinflation deal? You guys keep jumping up and down, this is gonna happen. And Mises laid it out in three uh, phases. Uh, and this was based on the typical inflation process and it was based on Ger German hyperinflation 1923. And he said in phase one, prices don't rise as much as money supply. And I think that's probably what we can say today is, uh, and it's because the public still has deflationary expectations. Governments thinks this is great, by the way, they can keep printing with impunity. Boy, this is great. These suckers keep taking this stuff, it's wonderful. So that's phase one. Phase two, instead of a uh, rising demand for money moderating, uh, price increases, a falling demand for money will intensify price inflation. So if you ask me where we are in this process, um, uh, we're, we're not in phase two. But could be any time. Phase three, prices go up faster than money supply, then there's a shortage of money. People urge government to print more money, and if government does this uh, prices and money spiral, uh, spiral up, uh, upwards, uh, the demand for money falls to zero. You've heard of all these stories about Weimar Germany, um, housewives waiting at the gate of the factory, husbands bringing armloads of banknotes, um, giving them to their wives who had a wheelbarrow to take the money to the store to buy anything in sight uh, before prices went up by the end of the day. And do not, they did not want to leave their uh, wheelbarrow unattended, uh, even if it was full of money, because uh, the wheelbarrow would be stolen and the money would just be kicked out into the dirt. <laughs> and so, by the way, people ask, what happens to stock prices during Weimar Germany? What, you know, what happened? And from 1914 and 1922, stock market rose uh, and I'm not sure what index they used, but it was uh, from 100 to 8,900. So people not only unloaded into goods and services, but also into stocks. And they would rather speculate. What happens in inflation is people would rather speculate than uh, work for wages. And of course in 1914, uh, the German mark was a quarter of a dollar. By October 23, it took 25.3 billion marks to a dollar, and only a month later it took 42.4.2 trillion marks for a dollar. So that is currently uh, ingrained in the experience of, uh, of the German people. Now, to switch over to banking, um, you know, loan banking is, is straightforward enough. If I save and start a bank and lend money to people, um, or maybe I might uh, channel people who, who are willing to give up uh, the current use of their money um, to lend it out for a return, it's a perfectly acceptable uh, line of business. There's examples of this, peer-to-peer uh, -peer lending. This is a relatively new phenomenon. Certainly in, in the internet, this is something called Prosper. And you can notice that uh, if you want to invest money, you, you can earn maybe 10.6%. And if you want to borrow money, you might 
Uh, you might borrow as low as 7.4. Obviously, there's, uh, there's going to be a spread between uh, what people uh, get for their money who deposit it with them um, and, and what people borrow, and the spread is going to be uh, captured by this Prosper company who does some loan underwriting and whatnot. But this is matching up borrowers and lenders throughout the world, and this is certainly legitimate. Uh, another company, Lending Club, uh, is another one. And again, um, investors are getting 9.6. Borrowers, that's their lowest rate. Most of them aren't. Here's our friend Sonny down here. He's a featured borrower. Doesn't look like a Sonny, but uh, he borrowed $9,000 at 14.07%. Uh, and is very happy to do so uh, to pay off his credit cards. So certainly legitimate banking. Deposit banking uh, is, uh, of course, the other side of the coin. That is when you would put money in a bank and expect them to watch the money for you. Not to lend it out, but to um, ensure that it's there, to guard it, to protect it. And uh, unfortunately, um, what has happened over, uh, over the centuries, uh, starting, with the, uh, starting with the goldsmiths who would keep people's gold and give them uh, certificates uh, for their gold. They began to create more certificates than there was in gold, and, and so fractionalized banking was born. Uh, but, oh, by the way, this is hard money lenders. If you're looking for um, you know, hard money loan, a private money loan, uh, they're on the internet now too. Uh, and again, this is legitimate loan banking uh, that's out there, whether you're a multifamily project or what have you. But I want to talk about three key cases in fractionalized banking uh, because a lot of people ask, hey, how'd this happen? How'd this, how'd this horse get out of the barn, so to speak? Well, 19, uh, or 1811, Carr versus Carr, the court had to decide whether the term uh, uh, debts mentioned in a will included a cash balance in a bank deposit account. And uh, the master of the rules, Sir William Grant, ruled that it did. And since the money had been paid generally into the bank and was not earmarked in a sealed bag, it had become a loan rather than a bailment. Then five years later, in Devane's versus Noble, despite an attorney's argument that a banker is rather a bailee of the consumer's or a customer's fund than his debtor, uh, because the money in his hands is rather a deposit than a debt, and may therefore be instantly demanded to take it up, the judge, uh, the same Judge Grant, ruled that, quote, money paid into a, banker's, into a banker's becomes immediately a part of his general assets and he is merely a debtor for that amount. And then later in Foley versus Hill and others, Lord Cottenham ruled money when paid into a bank ceases altogether to be the money of the principal, it is then the money of the banker who is bound to an equivalent by paying a similar sum to the deposited with him when he's asked for it. The money is placed in the custody of a banker to do with it what it, he pleases. And this is when it all went downhill in terms, of, uh, in terms of fractionalized banking. Now, the law has always been directly um, ambiguous in this area, uh, justifying fractional reserve banking because it's ultimately fractional reserves. Uh, fractional reserves really can't uh, survive on their own economically. Um, they must be uh, protected by uh, government. So um, this is the point where we, we talk about um, how money is created through a fractionalized banking system. And uh, many of you have probably seen this thing before, but um, uh, and I used to do this a little different. I think a couple years ago, we always assumed that uh, the Fed was going to buy treasuries uh, from a bank uh, to uh, possibly increase the money supply. But I had to change the story in light of the financial meltdown. Uh, the, buy, uh, the Fed buys worthless collateralized debt obligations from J.P. Morgan Chase. So um, they buy uh, this right here. It ends up being reserves, and we just uh, we're going to talk about this as a as a thousand. So 
Here's what the balance sheet looks like. Uh, some guy named Jones has a, a thousand bucks over here in uh, demand deposit checking account like probably most of you have. And then the reserves were increased by, uh, uh, by the Fed buying some, uh, some of this uh, toxic assets uh, from J.P. Morgan Chase. I don't know whether J.P. Morgan Chase had any toxic ass assets, but you know, let's just assume they did for the purposes of this. Now the Fed's balance sheet looks something like this. Uh, their assets now are Maiden Lane. Uh, that's the toxic assets they bought. Anybody know why they're called Maiden Lane? Because they actually are called Maiden Lane. Maiden Lane is the name of the street next to the New York Fed. And so they l cleverly called uh, the bailout uh, assets that they bought Maiden Lane 1, Maiden Lane 2, and Maiden Lane 3. So on the Fed's balance sheet, you have Maiden Lane for 1,000 and demand deposit at Morgan. Of course, Morgan's got this new 1,000 bucks. They need to lend it out. That's what they're going to do. They don't want to sit there and do nothing with it. And there's a, some guy named Rupert Murdoch who needs to borrow money right now. And uh, not to be confused with Rupert Holmes, who uh, did a song called the Pina Colada song. You're the only guy in the room that will remember that, right? Wow. Well, okay. So anyway, out of that thousand bucks, uh, they uh, make a loan to Murdoch, which of course is an asset. They've got reserves of thousand. Their total is uh, a, a, um, 1900. Their equity is the, uh, again, that demand deposit to some guy named Jones. Uh, the Murdoch loan, Mr. Murdoch puts the money uh, in his bank as a demand deposit. That's his 900. They total and balance at 1900. Of course, Murdoch immediately, immediately has lawyers to pay, as we know, um, and uh, because he's been, uh, somebody in his company has been hacking into, uh, hacking into phone calls, and uh, so he's got to uh, pay money to his lawyers, and of course, they bank at Goldman Sachs. So in Bank A, you've got a loan to Murdoch, you've got demand deposit, uh, again, for Mr. Jones, the, their reserves now are 100. Goldman Sachs now, the barristers, those are the loans that, uh, or those are the lawyers for Murdoch. They've got 900 bucks over here, reserves for 900. The Federal Reserve balance sheet looks like this. Again, the ma maiden lane junk that we talked about before. The demand deposits at the bank, Morgan for 100, Goldman Sachs at nine, 900. Now then, Goldman Sachs needs to make a loan to uh, somebody else that really needs help right now, and that's the state of California, because they're broke. So uh, they lend them $890. Again, we were assuming a 10% reserve ratio. So um, you can lend out, if you get uh, 1,000 in, you can lend out 900. If you get 900 in, you lend out 8, 8 10, and so on and so forth. Uh, people ask me, is that really the reserve ratio? It's the reserve ratio on demand deposits. The reserve ratio on savings deposit, zero. But if you did this example on zero, it would get out of hand really quickly. So that's why we're using 10. When Murray wrote his book, The Mystery of Banking, he used 20%. You didn't have near the multiplying that can take place that way. Again, Bank B, Goldman Sachs, loan to California, got reserves at 10, you're at 17, 17, 10. You've got uh, the barrister still got their demand deposits in there at 900. And of course, the state of California has uh, their uh, demand deposits at 810, so they balance at 1710. State of California needs to pay somebody. Who do they pay? Their retirement system, CalPERS, you know, all those... Uh, all those fire chiefs in California that are re retiring at $300,000 a year, they need to pay into that pension plan. So Bank B, you've got a loan to California there at Goldman Sachs. Um, on one side of the ledger at 810, the reserves at 90, demand deposit with the barristers. Bank C is CalPERS Bank. They've got a deposit um, with CalPERS and reserves uh, at 810. So the three banks line up something like this. Uh, you can kind of walk through that yourself. J.P. Morgan's got the Murdoch loan and the reserve uh, totaling up to the same as the demand deposit on the other side of the ledger. 
Uh, Goldman Sachs has got the California loan at 810 and, and their reserve um, with the Fed, the 990 or the demand deposit of 900 with the barristers, Wells Fargo, 810 and 810. The Fed has got their maiden lane junk offset by liabilities at Morgan, Goldman Sachs, Wells Fargo. You can see that the thousand, the thousand over here plus 900 plus 810 plus 729, so on and so forth, that thousand bucks they put in the banking system eventually becomes $10,000. And that's how you multiply the uh, deposits and the supply of money through the banking system. They bought a thousand bucks in CDOs from JP Morgan Chase, and eventually that becomes $10,000 in new money. So then you go, well, wow, how come we don't have, um, why don't we have a, a real inflationary mess right now? You know, because uh, you can see where this car is located in Greenwich, uh, where most of uh, uh, the hedge funds are in California. Uh, uh, you will see a Cayenne uh, in the parking lot here at the Institute. It is not this car. Um, but uh, anyway, this is the Fed's balance sheet. And that's uh, kind of a ghostly, uh, ghostly Ben Bernanke there. But you can see um, right here, this was the financial meltdown. And this green in here was made in lane, actually. They call it something else. You can't really read it real well, but it was the, they call it the bailout of uh, Bear Stearns and AIG, which is what uh, Maiden Lane actually is. These are treasuries down here. But their balance sheet went from roughly, I think, eight, nine hundred uh, billion to uh, 2.8 trillion now. So you've had this huge, huge increase in the Fed's balance sheet. So uh, based on what I just illustrated, you would think the money supply is going crazy, right? Just um, because that increase could be multiplied by 10 times if banks were out loaning it out, if they were out loaning it out to Rupert Murdoch and CalPERS and so on and so forth. But they're not. What are banks doing? This is a graph of excess reserves of deposit depository institutions. So they used to keep just almost nothing on reserve at the Fed until the financial crisis. And now all that big expansion of the, of, uh, the Federal Reserve is stuck right here. Banks are not lending the money out, and that's why you don't have this huge increase in the supply of money. It's being shown very nicely with that graph. If they were loaning it, this, where's my red dot? There it is. This graph would continue on way up here. But you can see since the financial crisis, loans have come down. And essentially now they're kind of flat, but they could come down even further. Most loans and in depository institutions in the United States, real estate. All of this, all this run up was real estate. It wasn't CNI loans, wasn't necessarily consumer loans, anything like that. Real estate cranked this up. Getting a real estate loan right now, very, very difficult. Now, but we still got money supply going up. This is true money supply. Um, this is uh, on our website. Uh, M2 is the green line. Uh, the true money supply that uh, has been developed, I think, uh, jointly. I think Murray was involved, Joe Salerno, probably others. Um, but we've still got an increase in supply of money, but again, it's not as great uh, possibly as it could be. But if you got money going uh, out, uh, obviously we got, uh, we got 44 million people that are uh, on food stamps. You've got unemployment at 9.2%. Uh, nothing on Main Street's happening. So where's the money going? Well, as all the money's been created over the years, um, it ends up going into speculation. Uh, this is the uh, 
from 1928 to 2011, um, easy money, money created out of nowhere, money created out of the banking system, inevitably goes um, into um, stocks, went into houses. Remember the housing boom? Um, you can see where it, uh, you, had a, you had a little boom here and a little boom there and then a big, 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 big boom. And then a crash and it is still, still crashing to this, uh, to this day. How about commercial real estate? Had a bunch, bunch of that money that was created, ended up in commercial real estate. Uh, every once in a while you'll read lately the commercial real estate's coming back. Uh, it is not, as you can tell from this, um, as you can tell from this graph, um, it is not uh, coming back in any way, shape, or form. Uh, there are some trophy properties that are doing fairly well, but uh, uh, by and large, uh, commercial real estate isn't doing very well. Where's another place? Probably the biggest bubble that is out there right now is government bonds. Now, I don't think I need to tell this crowd that the increase in supply of government debt has exploded, right? So even though it's exploded, you can see the trend in yield. And yield, of course, is the opposite of price. As yield goes down, prices go up. So you can see that the price of bonds has gone continually up since 1980. Uh, despite a huge, huge increase in supply. And that's where a lot of hot money is gone. Uh, most of the buyers of this debt, certainly, whoops, during this period, whoops, the Fed is buying most of it here. Biggest buyer of government debt right in there. Consumer price index. Um, most people would say this is understated for sure. Um, if you follow John Williams at shadowstats.com, he would say uh, this falls far, far behind. Right now the uh, uh, CPI is running at 3.6%. Uh, he would say it's running more like 9, 10, 11. Uh, but you can see that um, uh, prices reflect that increase in the money supply that uh, I showed you. So in, uh, in conclusion, Probably uh, my second favorite slide that I have, you will see uh, tomorrow my favorite slide. Um, but this is what happens uh, when government um, has its way. Instead of money being hard work and it becomes some, pet, some economist's pet theory that they think they can print prosperity, they think they can print savings, uh, this is what ultimately happens to it. Toilet paper only to be used in this toilet. And down here, uh, next to the bottom, no. Even if they say 100 trillion, they didn't want them in their toilet. Thank you. I'm sure, you, I'm sure you have a 15 minute break and um, we will be back at four o'clock. Did I really? Yeah, oh, all right. That one's off? I don't, I don't know if that was ever really off.